Hey, I'm Matt. This is No Dumb Questions, and I'm really excited about this episode because I get to have a friend on. Her name is Leonor Ortega Till. We went to middle school together, and I went on to you know do some stuff or whatever. She went on to become a rock star. She's been a part of the band Five Iron Frenzy since forever. She's now the lead singer of a band called The Fast Feeling, and she's really good at the music thing. But in addition to the music thing, she's also worked in the inner city of Denver with a fascinating, diverse community of people. And that's going to come through in the conversation that we get into here in just a minute. But a quick side note, all the way back in conversation number one between Destin and I, when we were, I guess, deciding whether or not we should be friends, I asked him what kind of music he liked. And he said, well, there's this one band that was very formative for me as a young man and that I still really appreciate to this day. And it's Five Iron Frenzy. And I was like, hey, I know somebody who's in that band. I have a friend who's a part of that band. And I don't know if he believed me or not. And we kind of backburnered that for the time being. But I know that Five Iron Frenzy, a band that maybe many of you haven't even heard of, but you should, was something that was really important to Destin. And so I thought it would be a blast to get on the phone with Destin and Leonor and just kind of put us all together and have a conversation. We're going to take the first few minutes of this conversation to reminisce just a little bit about the past, talk a little bit about music. But the bulk of this conversation this is going to be about life and some big picture stuff. And I think you're really going to like where it goes. I just don't want to spoil it for you. So that's kind of the breakdown. One other quick thing is that three people on the phone, we have a little bit of feedback here and there. I don't think it's too big of a deal and I'm not smart enough to fix it. So that's there. Be aware. And let's get to the conversation. I've got my friend Leonor on the phone. And one of the first conversations I had with you, Destin, involved, like we got into the whole, like, what do you like about the world and what are you into? And I think we touched on music. And the very first band that you listed was Five Iron Frenzy. Destin. That is correct. Is that true? It really was. It, really? It is true. This was conversation one, uh, Destin Sandlin, Matt Whitman, conversation one. I listened to, I mean... I used to listen to Five Iron Frenzy, of course. Nobody actually still <laughs> listens to you, right? No, 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 no. Probably just me. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. But why did you guys put the bumper stickers out that said, I used to listen to Five Iron Frenzy? Why did we? Because it's funny <laughs> and it's true for a lot of people. <laughs> it is good. The, I, I don't want to, I know, Leonore, that you are this super famous rock star and you have to talk about that all the time. <laughs> and so I, I, I want to avoid talking about that because I could fanboy for realsies for a long time. And that's really fun for me. But I I just want to make sure this is legit because Matt said he was friends with you. Right. And I don't believe him. I haven't believed him for years. So is, is this a real deal? Well, let's remember the story that I told you in the Nashville club about, or did I tell you the story about me and Matt? No, you, you told, you were going to tell me. And I said, no, I want to hear oh, when mics are rolling. So but you told my now. wife. Yeah. Yeah. I feel this weird apprehension. <laughs> like, like, my heart is moving faster than it was a second ago. Yeah, it, I love it when things from my eighth grade year yeah. come up. Matt, do you remember the roller skating rink, Warnoco West? Yes, I do remember the roller skating rink, Warnoco West in Greeley, Colorado. Do you have any memory of me at Warnoco West? The comfort level continues to decrease <laughs> This is so good. Uh, um. Gosh, I couldn't say for okay. sure. It's been so long. All right, so let me remind you. I think it was when we were in eighth, I think you're a year older than me. So I was in seventh grade and you were in eighth grade. I think that's right. And we were at the roller skating rink and it might've been Valentine's Day. I'm not sure, but it was definitely the song where the guys line up against the wall and the girls get to skate by <laughs> and ask the guys to skate. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. I could imagine that happening. Actually, it was the other way around. It was the other way around. I could around. imagine that happening you were at an event. You asked me. Okay. Do you remember what I said to you when you asked me if I would skate with you? Did it involve my clothing? Close. Yeah, totally. So you had like, at the time, it was like the coolest skater boy haircut, but I was such a country hick that I had no idea that shaved on the side and long down the eyeball was cool. <laughs> And you came up to me and you asked me to skate. And I said, no, because you have girls there. I totally remember. <laughs> no way. Yes, I did. I felt so bad. But I was like, no, you have girls hair or something like something really mean about your hair and your style. Because you were a skater boy and I wasn't used to it. And then I felt bad. And years later, I was like, oh, actually, dude, that guy was kind of cool. Yeah, I, I feel like you've had a chance to interact <laughs> with, with some people who are into, you know, the whole skating scene since then. 
Well, yeah, because right after that, when I joined high school, I started going to youth group in Greeley and met a lot of skater kids. And in fact, um, a bunch of them worked at uh, it was like a skater shop. And I started seeing, oh, this is a cool style when guys wear their hair like that and kind of flip their head all the time. <laughs> Oh. That was definitely you. Yeah, back then. I still do that a lot because I mean we haven't seen each other for a while, but I still have like a, a ton of hair, and it's really attractive, like a lot. I'm really sure I've hair. seen the pictures really of you. Come on, hair. dang it! She's <laughs> making oh, <laughs> Leonor's making fun of me because you're bald. This is the best no, day you ever. Put it out there. <laughs> the you know, the other thing I remember oh, about man. that incident, and and maybe maybe you're right. But I internalized <laughs> that rejection, and I believe the song was Forever Your Girl by Paula Abdul, which made it, which is wow. awkward. I don't know why they would have gone with that, because it's like a, it's like a just, hey, friendly, <laughs> how are you doing? And then they put on Forever Your Girl. So I felt weird already about awkward. asking, because I, I wasn't trying to assert that I would be Forever Your Girl by asking you to skate right. with me. I, I, right. just, I just wanted you which to skate with Which is what I assumed I internally. Cool. It, sure. And so... <laughs> Are you being sarcastic right now, or do you actually remember the song that occurred? I know. Do you really remember? I remember the song. Yeah. And, no and, way. and to me, I internalized a critique of my clothing, <laughs> and I changed my wardrobe literally that day. No. Yeah. I had a shirt no. that I had had since sixth grade, and it-, it Was it flowery? <sighs> worse. It depicted a mountain scene. It was, it was vividly uh -huh. yellow, like a street sign or macaroni and cheese. <laughs> And the complementing color was like an aqua green, but the aqua green oh. was all in puff paint. And it was a, a puff Ooh. painting of a beautiful mountain scene. And it said something like mm -hmm. mountains on it. And for some <laughs> reason, I still, like, you know how sometimes you have clothes that you're like, wow, that's cool, but you haven't really revisited that for years? Right. That was that shirt. And so I felt like I internalized it as also that you were accusing me of dressing like a girl. Which would be accurate because my shirt had puff paint on it. I probably said something like that too. <laughs> probably. Well, I, I have an, I have another question. Right. Well, first of all, I, I need to do something real quick. If you'll just stand by, I need to say something to Matt. Matt, I apologize. It was real. I thought you were lying on conversation <laughs> one. Ob obviously, this really happened. So I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a hardcore name dropper. I deserve that. Now, I need I need to ask something of Leonor here. So the story I heard later on, I think it was in a vulnerable moment with Matt. Is there something to do with a dance? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we had a lot of school dances. We probably danced together. Probably Pour Some Sugar on Me by Def Leppard or something. I don't know. I, I would have enjoyed <laughs> if, that. If he would have asked... A, yeah, if he would have asked, I would have said yes. Like, I probably did. Because our the fact that he knows me is not really bizarre because our school was teeny tiny, really small. So it didn't matter if you were a cowboy or into rap or if you were academic or goth or whatever. You all were friends. At our school, everyone, everyone, it was small. So everyone knew each other pretty well. So Matt was like in your, like there weren't really cliques at your school? No, I mean, it's too small to have cliques. So, but you you didn't live in Alt, right? You were up the street? I lived in Pierce, Colorado. And to be fair and to be honest, like this is going to sound really weird and I'm not a racist person, but to be honest, like growing up, I'm Mexican American. And so if there were, there weren't cliques, but honestly, like as far as, you know, quote unquote dating or interests. Honestly, like I was not familiar with the non-Hispanic crowd and certainly not romantically. That was that had never really occurred to me. And even up until before I got married, I was like, hey, maybe I should just hang out with the POD guys and revisit this uh, race thing. Like, <laughs> Fun that that's an option if, for you. If they give me, yeah, yeah, if they give me a cool vibe, maybe I'll just ditch the uh, the current boyfriend. But no, he found his way into my heart. But <laughs> honestly, like. White guys were kind of yeah. off limits romantically in my mind. I don't know why. I I don't know. It's just it was a weird thing, and something to be said for small minded countryside ness, I guess. So, Leonor, you're you would consider yourself a country girl because I um, I totally from the outside looking in, you know, I I'll just you know yeah. people are different depending on what they do. Like for for example, to to me, you mm -hmm. are literally a rock star that. and you you travel around and you you go to shows and you play mm -hmm. these things and like the the four times i've seen you no three times i've seen you you've always been on stage performing mm -hmm. with the one exception i i interacted with you one time and it was really interesting because you were it was after a show and you were graciously giving your time to people you were clearly tired but i talked to you 
and you were you were doing your level best to interact with me on the heart level, but I could tell you were tired, and mm-hmm. it was it yeah. was it was interesting to me because I realized at that moment that people have different different I don't know how how do you, how do I say this? It's like they're different things to different people. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. What do you you mean like different energy levels at the end of the show, or people are introverts or extroverts? You were in rock star mode. Oh. And I I know, you know, I've read a little bit about, you know, what you do. You you work in inner city stuff and you're a mom mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. you're a rock star. And it seemed to me that you had different modes and you were in rock star mode that night. It was interesting to me because I right. it it made me think things about myself. You know what I mean? That, yeah, that does make sense. There there is something to that. And there's honestly, I feel like when I'm in rock star mode, I don't use those words. The way I feel is that I'm the hostess of a huge party. And more, I guess the word would be entertainer and performer because you get certain people that are in bands that are obviously musicians. They love recording. They love the craft. They love writing. They could be content in the studio all the time. And that is not me. Like I, the cherry on top for me is the performance and the connection with people. Totally like what you're saying. And so for me, since that is the thing that I love the most about being in the band is meeting people and traveling. I, yeah, I'm always out there. I'm not in the green room. I'm not just by myself. It's like, this is my opportunity to hang out with people. And not because I want the attention for me necessarily, but I am such an extrovert that I just feed off knowing people. And if I get my way, I'll stick in contact with people. And then through the years, you know, every time I'm in the same city, I'll check them out and then we become friends. So there's something in it for me too, relationally. So I think that whether I'm tired or not, it's it's honestly a selfish thing that I like. I like just talking to people and meeting people. That's super interesting. Do, do you feel like you're in a different mode when you're doing that? Mm, I don't know. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Because one of the things you have to do is there are a lot of people standing there awkwardly waiting for your time and attention. And so the trick is um, to basically be like a like the center of of a bicycle wheel. Like you're going to try to pull everybody together and find things they have in common with their kids and these people. And where do you live? And instead of just awkward one at a time, like a, like a wedding receiving line, I don't like that vibe. I'd rather it just be, um, just everybody talking and hanging out. So the focus isn't just on me. And so it doesn't feel like I have something to tell you. I would rather it be very natural. And so I do feel like there's a certain, um, finesse that comes with that and a mode that comes with that. And, there's a natural orbit that happens. And there's certain people, I'll be honest, there are certain people that are just so good at doing that. I've watched Mike Carrera from MXPX for the past couple of years, and he can work a crowd and make everybody feel heard and interested and interesting and included um, no matter what. And, and that's not everybody has that gift. I noticed I was on the receiving end of that when I was interacting with you, Lenore, and it was awesome. It was so cool because mm. I knew... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was really, really cool. I enjoyed it. And I've I've seen you do it as well, Matt, when, you know, at the end of, you know, Sunday morning sermon, which was mediocre, obviously. Oh goodness, I mean, best. it wasn't that great. <laughs> yeah, it, it was pretty bad. But but afterwards, I, I noticed that it, it was, I don't know, it was really interesting. So so who who would you say that you are most of the time? Would Would you say that you have different hats or do you wear all the hats at once? I think the way I describe it is kind of that it, there's one thread going through everything I do that has the same, I guess I would say purpose and energy. Um, different hats are mom to an 11 year old son and nine year old daughter. And so there's a lot of energy and fun and curiosity to that. But then, you know, digging up theology and looking at books and studying for different sermons, I preach and speak. I travel and speak at many different events. What do you talk about when you speak? Uh, it depends. It's been fascinating. This is my first year of uh, what I call being sent out. And for 16 years prior, I worked at Scum of the Earth Church in Denver. I was one of the founders. And that was that was a really cool gig. But after the, like, the last four years, I was kind of um, repeating the same year. And it was a good year, but I kept repeating it. And I felt, no, I got to do something else. And so when I left Scum, um, I had this idea that you know, I have a voice, a capital V voice. And for whatever reason, after Five Iron got back together, I felt that people really care what I have to say and what we have to say. And so I felt that I had a responsibility to use my voice. And so I've put myself out there and it's been um, fascinating, the types of things I've been invited to. Just just so it doesn't sneak by for people who aren't familiar, 
It sounded like you said the name of the church you were involved with was Scum of the Earth Church? Yes, scumoftheearth.net. That is an abnormal name for a church. Well, the singer of Five Iron came up with that. His name's Reese Roper. And it was that kind of deal where he said, we should be called Scum of the Earth because people view Christians as scum and we know we're not. And we're going to flip it on his head, our, its head because honestly, we are and we aren't. It's the weird dichotomy about um, believing in something. I was about to say, I feel kind of <laughs> scummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are. We pretty much are. We're scum, but we're not, you know, right? And the best is like, when our church would help with certain events like, you know, prayer at the flagpole at the at the Capitol. And this woman with beautiful curled hair said, oh, honey, you know, you're not the scum. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, we get good. it. We're, <laughs> we're OK. <laughs> but that that verse comes out of uh, First Corinthians. And so it's just the concept of like a lot of people would rather say they're going to scum than they're going to church, you know? Yeah, I, I knew th- there was this one college where they had there was a bar downtown called Fluids Lab. Ooh, weird. And so the mechanical engineer is like, where are you guys going? Oh, we got to go to Fluids Lab. Got to go, you know, Fluids Lab. That sounds kind of like so, a disease, like you're getting tested for yeah. a disease. I don't like it. I would not want to <laughs> It's go. exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do, so it's the worst <laughs> I example I could bring up. I apologize. It's so, like a detox anyway. center. <laughs> This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by Casper. Casper's a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. You spend a third of your life sleeping, right? So you might as well be comfortable, which is why this mattress combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface with the right amount of sink and bounce. They're designed, developed, and assembled in the U.S. and delivered right to your door in a small how they do that size box at an affordable price because Casper cuts out the middleman and sells directly directly to the consumer. We love Casper mattresses at our house. We have four, no joke. And the other night we had a buddy and uh, his wife stay over at the house in the guest room. And when they did at the breakfast table, she woke up and said, what kind of mattress do you have? Because it's the first night I woke up without neck pain in months. No joke, that happened. I thought it was a really awesome data point. Anyway, if you want to get 50 bucks towards any mattress purchase, you can do so by going to casper.com slash NDQ and use NDQ at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. You can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. Again, that's casper.com slash NDQ and use NDQ at checkout. Thanks to Casper for supporting No Dumb Questions, and let's get back to the conversation. What year did you start doing the music thing, Leonor? 1995 with Five Iron. I was still my senior year of high school at Highland. I would drive up on weekends and practice. Um, The way I learned how to jam and play music was my mom was going to Ames. When she was doing that, me and my dad had a music room in our house in Pierce. And we had piano, saxophone, trumpets, um, tons of percussion instruments. And we'd put on Motown and also old Tejano music and Mexican music. And we would just jam like for hours. That's wonderful. Do you do you remember the time that I gave you a ride up to your place in my Datsun 210 hatchback and I forced you to listen to almost the entirety of the Weird Al off the deep end cassette tape? <laughs> I do remember that. Yes. <laughs> oh man. You were so patient. I was wondering. I was like all this stuff sounds like, you know, Matt's making it up and she's just going along with it, but that that sounded real. No, that's how real. How can you forget yeah. the Datsun B210? Yeah, I don't remember Weird Al, though, but I remember riding in your car. <laughs> Golly, man. This is so impressive to me. This is, I, I just have to stop and admire this. You, like, man, this this is from my formative years, mm-hmm. 20 years ago, and then I have a phone conversation with some dumb guy from Wyoming. That's hurtful. In, in my <laughs> garage, and it's like everything connected in the weirdest possible way. This This makes no sense at all. Well, that's what's interesting to me. You asked me something about, um, was I, well, do I think of myself as a country girl? And I do, because honestly, we had to have massive imaginations growing up in Pierce. We had a tiny little piece of concrete we could skateboard on. We could totally try our hand at raising animals, which always died. That's, I mean, I had so many bunnies and cats and dogs and fish and crawdads and turtles, but 
Other than that, there wasn't much to do. So you had to be musical or you had to be artistic. You had to find your own fun. Um, And so I think when you think of like a suburban girl, she might hang out at the mall and know about fashion and hairstyles and go to the movie theater. Like never did that. Maybe once a year at a movie theater, hardly went out to eat. Um, I'd never had sushi or Middle Eastern or Chinese or tons of food until I was in college because, you know, growing up in Pierce, maybe occasionally we'd go to like an Italian restaurant, but I'm totally a country girl. I was very sheltered. Um, I knew Spanish and I knew Mexican culture, but I didn't know people of other cultures, certainly like not very much diversity. So yeah, I think that I was very much sheltered just because of my physical circumstance. Has that changed how you raised your children? Yes. And in fact, I chose um, public school early on considering the fact that their job as humans of the world is to be a blessing. And I tell them constantly, your job, your one job is to be a blessing. So you will go to school with people of different races, different religions, different, um, different capabilities. And I want you to learn and be a blessing and be blessed. And I've decided to raise them at scum of the earth where they know men and women that are homeless, people that are um, goths, people that are transvestites, different types of people. And we vocalize and we talk about it. It's not like a sheltered situation. They know even going to church, it may not be a safe place. You do not come first. I'm not going to ask that man to leave or move his seat or shower because of you. You need to figure out how to function in this world because you are part of the world. And so, yeah, I think, I think very much I wanted them to have experiences that I never had. And in fact, they're going to come with me to Hawaii. And that's part of the next step too, is, you know, they didn't, they're not going to get these kind of opportunities unless I really try for them to have them. So you're going out of your way to expose them to what most people would think are negative things yeah. like mm-hmm. drugs. Yes. Like, like, you know, just giving them a little <laughs> line of cocaine or something like well, that. Just see what, what happens. <laughs> yeah. Quick story, right? So, I'm sorry. That was, that was, that was too far. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. No, my kid walks by, we walk by the church, right? And we see a, a body. We'll put it that way, a body. And first of all, we recognize who the body is because we go to church with him. And my daughter, who at the time I think was five was like, call detox mom. <laughs> Really? So she knows. You don't call the cops. You call detox. And she knows, you know, we're going to sit with him and wait till detox comes. She know, They know. They know. They understand. Since they were very young, I could be walking them in a stroller, walking next to someone, and this has happened, who has a shopping cart. And that is my, my friend in, in the Lord, and we're walking, and it looks weird, but we have more in common than we, than, you know, than we don't have. So I think that it's important to raise kids knowing that the world is intense and my parents get really upset because maybe I share too much in their minds with, with my kids. Matt, what do you think about all this? Sorry, you, you know, I'm doing the thing where I just sit quietly and think I am thinking I was out of podcast mode entirely and into what am I doing with my (laughs) life mode? Yeah, Yeah, I'm, I was doing the same thing because we, we actively attempt to preserve, uh, you know, we, we call it moral innocence to make mm-hmm. ourselves feel good, mm-hmm. but you would say sheltered. Mm-hmm. And it's making me realize that I'm on one end of the spectrum and you're on the other. We are on total opposite ends of the spectrum here. Well, and I didn't even realize yeah. it until we started talking. And what's interesting I mean, is, my, go, go on, sorry. Go, no, 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 no. I, I was just, that was me just trying to, my brain is broken at the moment. <laughs> I, I'm, go ahead. I was going to say. I'm learning more from you. What's interesting is I do try to preserve a certain amount of innocence, however, because I don't like TV. We don't even have TV. Um, As far as violence, watching violence, and we talk about sexuality, but they don't watch sexuality. I want them to know the why more than the what, and then eventually we can add up the what, and we're getting there with my 11-year-old son. We opted out of, you know, school sex ed. We get to do that part as parents, which is so awkward, but so good. (laughs) Um, And and so there is a, there's a fine line between, I want them to be in the world, but not of the world. And I want them to know what happens, but I also want them to come in with this, uh, an ounce of respect. There's this interesting thing that's happening in society now where people say, well, you have to earn my respect. And being Mexican American, I was raised very much that no, it's a human. It has respect. This person does. An elder gets more respect. There's a tier yeah. of respect. Women get a certain amount of respect for yep. certain things. Um, 
especially the matriarch, like heaven forbid you walk into a house and don't say hi to grandma first. And in our household, you know, it could be elders sit and the kids watch. It's certainly not you earn my respect. I don't like that philosophy. And, and so I'm trying to instill in my kids that people have your respect first. And if they lose it, they lose it. That's a bummer. But you give it first. And so I wonder if that's going to be interesting for them when they become teenagers and and find their friends and, and learn the other point of view. I don't know what they'll think. I have a question. Yeah. Can, can I, I'm not going to push back because you, you've. No, you, you can. And, you can. I don't, work, I don't care. <laughs> I, I know, but you, you and your work has influenced my life for good in, in so many ways. Um, and my, my kids have, they, you know, they sing about really deep truths because of you. But here's, here's a, a question. What are the harms of this or the potential harms? I, I'm not saying there is anything bad, but I know you've gamed it out. You're smart, <laughs> a smart woman. Right. What, what have you, what are the boundary conditions you've put on this? Hey, we're going to let them see everything with the exception of certain things. What are the mm-hmm. potential risks and how have you mitigated those? Because I know you have. Well, there's one that kind of takes you by surprise, but it becomes that you put yourself on a pedestal and you puff yourself up because you think, oh, we're urban. We have hmm. friends of different races and different ideologies. And so the last couple of years, we were attending a very suburbanite church that smelled like suburbia, that looked like suburbia, that had programs. What does suburbia smell like? Uh, Clorox. <laughs> I knew you'd have an answer. Because <laughs> yeah. scum of the earth does not smell like Clorox. It smells like incense and BO and weed, legal weed, all kinds of things. Proud uh, legal weed. Yeah, but I will say... We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, but going back to... um, We went to suburban church because I wanted my kids to understand that this is part of Christianity too. This is, you know, pews and cheesy hymns and fake fog. We're not better than that. I mean, it sucks because you hymns want and to be fog better than together? that. Like, I feel like that's a brand catastrophe <laughs> right there. Those those don't mix well. It's a brand catastrophe. Church is just, I mean, the solos and the and the guys in their 50s with those bedazzled jeans. Oh, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. I do. You know. Well, I thought you were going a different way with that when you said no. the, the risk is that you could, um, I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, haughtiness. Yes. The opposite of humility. Yes. I thought I thought what you were saying when you first started talking was the risk is that you could think to yourself, oh, we're so far in the trenches, we're doing good that other people aren't doing. But I think that's a risk anywhere. I mean, it's yeah. a risk n- no matter where you're at, it, you know, oh, look at how much we're giving or look at how much we're whatever. That that humility, I don't know, was it C.S. Lewis that said the moment you realize you're being humble is the moment you're no longer being humble. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that sounds right. When you become aware of it, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, oh, I'm humble. Well, yeah, you were. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that's a, what you're talking about seems to me like it could be a risk at any point. Or any position. Well, it is a risk. I mean, whether that's a my husband and I talk about a lot, like whether you homeschool or you send your kids to public school, it's all a risk. Like, you know, they're they're gonna there's sacrifices on every level of whatever you do with kids. Um, there's no perfect way to do it. And you have to trust the kids, you have to look and trust the kids' personality too. Not every kid is set up for certain situations. And some of my friends have had to leave scum of the earth because their kids need a different type of situation. They're the kind of kids that may run off and may not understand that it's not safe to, you know, to wander around the church. And you just have to look and see what's best for a certain type of kid. But for ours, this has worked pretty good. This has worked well. And communication, just talking and talking and talking and talking about who's there, what are they doing, what are we learning, how, you know, how does society work? And I guess just also letting them be part of the ministry without ever talking about that part. You know, you just do it. Just do it, you know? So if I, l- let me see if I'm articulating your position well, because I think that's that's important to be able to describe what the other person's thinking. So would you describe that type of parenting as like setting up fences and then putting the kids in the fence and then just, you know, you kind of parent them over there, but you're very much actively parenting, like you're in the fence with them, so to speak or maybe there is no fence, but you're right there holding their hand. Whereas people that might parent more like myself, we kind of set up these situations where they're safe and then we speak into their life. Whereas you're right there with them Mm -hmm. 
helping them at every step of the way. Is that kind of how it feels to you? Because you seem very much like an active parent. I'm very active, but I think I think one of the differences of what I'm hearing you say is safe versus unsafe. I'm saying let's assume it's safe until something happens. I really appreciate that. A homeless person is not necessarily unsafe. A homeless person is just someone who doesn't have a home. And and the fascinating thing is once you know them, once you hang out with them for years, like some of the people even on our leadership team can be homeless. It's once you know them for years and their circumstance and understand people, it's very different than safe versus unsafe. And the same can be true of, you know, the way a person looks or the neighborhood. Um, let's say the first year we moved into our neighborhood, everybody got their their windows busted out. But then after a few years being there, it's like, you know, people in the neighborhood and they're happy you're there and they promote you being there. And so unsafe and safe, my, I'm not really too concerned with the safety of my kids um, because I'm I'm smart enough to know if it's an unsafe situation, but I'm not going to assume that that a place or a person is unsafe. And what you're doing isn't exactly, uh, compared to the rest of the world, Destin, it's not exactly safe. I mean, you're teaching your no. kids to be yeah. safe, but your kids are not leading some sheltered life. I'm not comfortable with the characterization you're letting Leonore <laughs> have of how your kids are existing. I mean, well, they're, they're yeah, all over the I, I country that. with you. They're in other <clears throat> countries with you. You're shooting drones out of trees. I mean, I, I've, I've <laughs> well, seen your kids handle yeah, weapons. You, they know what to do. I mean, there's just, whoa. you just live in a different place. So the, the risks and the questions that you have to tackle being where you're at in Alabama are going to be different than downtown Denver and different than mm -hmm. here. You know what the biggest risk, you know, the biggest safety concern we have for our kids at our church is? What? Bears. Lions. Serious? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, saw saw a mountain lion out in the backyard at church, and then I mean, we just we we butt right up against the wild wow. by fish back there. Yeah. So it's I mean, you know it's it's just different worlds, and so I feel like I feel like my kids mm -hmm. are not particularly sheltered. Like I just take them out and throw them in the woods with me, and mm -hmm. no trails, no nothing. We just bushwhack out into wherever and experience mm -hmm. wild things, and we experience people that you would never run into in Alabama or even in Denver, even mm -hmm. though it's only six hours away. It's, I think it's about a posture that we take with how we expose our kids to the world. I also, kind of what he was saying, what Matt was saying, um, that I appreciate, there's also this parenting trend happening where, oh no, I want a mimosa, but my little son can't see it because he'll think it's orange juice. And so I don't want to hurt him by drinking something that looks like orange juice in front of him. So I'm going to wrap my napkin around it. No, you tell him this has alcohol, so you cannot drink it as a kid. I'm the mother and an adult, so I can. I get so annoyed when people are trying to protect their kids from unhappiness and things they <clears throat> cannot have. And heaven forbid there be, you know, benefits to being an adult. And so that just, that makes me crazy. Just say no, no, you so cannot have it. I'm trend in general, though. I can say this word. That so is a societal <laughs> trend in general to, to try to make everything safe. Right. And, and stuff just isn't safe. The so, world isn't safe. Life isn't safe. You take no. reasonable precautions, but you got to live with it. So, Leonor, do you have the same uh, policy when it comes to firearms, teaching your children about how to operate firearms? No, because I don't have firearms. I I don't own any, and my husband doesn't own any, and it's not that I'm against other people owning any, but I just don't, and there's not really a need for me, and I'm probably, my personality type is more like just lay down and suffer the consequence rather than fight back. That's totally me, and I'm okay with that, and that's totally my husband, and he's okay with that, so we're probably not going to go that route, but when they get a certain age, if they want to learn, I don't, I don't mind. I was just wondering because, I mean, I know out there there's a lot of, yeah, you know, you know why I asked. I'm wondering if, if you, if you apply these principles across all different areas of your life or if it's, and it seems like you do, it's just you, you have your own preference and do you choose what to expose your children to or do you try to expose them to everything? I'm not trying to, I'm just bringing them into yeah. my life. And that's if there I'm are hearing. certain things in my life, that's cool. Cause I don't go to like rager parties where people are wasted. Um, there have been times where we've played with MXPX in downtown Denver, and I brought the kids to the show, and they can come, but I took them down to the green room for one minute and smelled the air and saw around and was like, nope, we'll just say our highs and buys. And uh, there, there are things that are appropriate and then things that are not. Um, so so I, mm -hmm. that would have been unsafe, and that would have been just stupid. I don't want, 
I'm not putting on rated R movies or anything. In fact, what's really funny about me is I don't even watch rated R movies. Like I can't watch any, like even PG-13 is pushing it. Like I visually do not watch things or hear things that, um, I, I, what's funny is my husband calls me a self-sheltered person. And in some ways I am because life itself is rough enough that I don't need my entertainment to try to mess with me, you know? Huh. That is something we see different. I like to that be is not entertaining. Yeah. That is not entertaining to me. And it might to me be, it is. I would um, love to be provoked. <laughs> let me ask you this. I really does your do. wife does your wife feel the same? Does she watch the same things you can? Can she hang with you? Yeah, overwhelmingly. There are a few exceptions. Wow. For her okay. stuff that gets just a little too scary. And and yeah. like neither, neither of us are into just uh, you know, blood fest slaughter right. horror stuff. It just doesn't it doesn't work. I don't I don't like it, neither does she. But I like mm -hmm. I like really thoughtful psychological suspense and mm -hmm. she does not, she is not bothered by uh, scalpel incisions or injections. Ooh. I cannot stink yeah. and watch them. I put my oh, hand up, thanks. tell me when it's over. I can't this conversation, do it. man. But right. this conversation got so She's, weird. This is, awesome. this is the best conversation what, what we've had in <laughs> <laughs> Do you, oh, I, I, I don't like horror movies no, at all. There's no reason to sit there and be scared the whole time. Mm -hmm. I just, no, we just don't do it. She no, won't watch I've Stranger even, Things with me. I watched Stranger Things and that was, that's like, that's, that's fine. That's like pushing the edge right there. I never watched Game of Thrones. Couldn't do, um, what's that one everyone likes about that meth guy from New Mexico? Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad. Loved it. Can't do that. Just loved <laughs> it. She <laughs> bailed on, she bailed on that one after the, uh, acid nope. in the bathtub incident. Yeah. Yeah. I watched one episode oh, wow. too. Same thing. And I was like, nope. Or like certain scenes into a movie. We've even paid for movies or gone into movie, movie theaters and three scenes in someone's getting his head chopped off and I walk out. Like, that's, What's the that's last enough. movie you walked Thank out you. of? Um, any of those, like, and this has been a while, but I'll admit I, I, it'd be like with the guys and they're all guys on tour, you know, the band guys, and they'd want to see something like, um, and we all walked out as a band. We all went to see like one of those American Pie movies or something. We walked in about ten minutes, and we all, as a whole band, walked out. We were like, "No, this is gross. This is that's, stupid." That, you know? Yeah, my last one was Super Troopers, and it was the same thing. Like <laughs> yeah, all of that content kind of could be funny. Stupid. I just didn't like it. Just, it, no. yeah, it didn't resonate with me. It and I, I really feel sad and upset when like my big thing, and why not say it on a podcast? I cannot handle teenage sexuality. It just puts me through the roof. I don't want to see it. I want to talk about it. So we're not going to talk about it at the end. <laughs> Good. I didn't want to talk about it either. I want to step aside from the conversation for just a second for a couple of reasons here. Agenda item number one is to say thanks again, as always, to the patrons, the people who financially support No Dumb Questions. You don't have to do that in order to listen, but gosh, it's really cool that some of you do. So thanks a ton. Patreon.com is a website. It's a place where you can go to support content creators on the internet, people who make YouTube channels and people who make podcasts like this, and a bunch of you do. So thanks a ton. If you're at a place where you're interested in supporting us, hey, that's awesome. Patreon.com slash no dumb questions is how you do that. You can make some kind of like monthly pledge or something to kick in whatever makes sense for you. Or once again, nothing is also cool because we're just thankful that you're here. Okay, agenda item number two is that we are about to change tones on the conversation we are in the midst of. And of all the weird things, it's about to turn toward marijuana and drug legalization. And I know that some of you listen to this with your kids, and you would probably much rather have that conversation with them yourselves without our opinions interfering with it. So if you want to sit it out, this is your fair warning that we're headed in that direction. I think it's a really great constructive conversation, but eh, if I was a parent, I'd want a heads up on that. So there's your heads up. Let's get back to the conversation. <laughs> Did you guys know that I put out an album where I sing? No. When did you do this? I did it last year with two of the other guys in Five Iron and a guy named Matt who's in a band called Eleventy Seven. Really? 
Yeah. So basically we had a bunch of leftover songs that were going to be five iron songs and I love writing lyrics and melodies. And so um, we decided to make a band and it's basically new wave. It's like synth pop, new wave music. What? It's awesome. It's very similar to metric and I sing. Yeah. It's great. What? Yeah. This is Check it ticking out. all my boxes. Yeah. What did you, I mean, do you have like, do you have a band name or where do I find this? Yeah. Yeah. It's called the fast feeling. It's on Spotify or Apple music or anything. Yeah. It's good stuff. And we even have, we have a video out, but I must warn you, it is visually disturbing but the content of the song is so it's it's pretty int- like I wouldn't necessarily show kids our video, but the the music is really good. You have so many F's in your band names. The fast feeling, sweet. Yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah, check it out. See what you think. other stuff are you doing leonore you've got so you got these speaking gigs if people want you to come speak at their thing how can they how can they find you they can email me at leonor till at gmail but also if they go to urban sky s-k-y-e um like the isle of sky is the ministry that i'm part of here in denver and so urban sky has a website and you can go to my page there and read basically kind of what my heart is i also do interestingly enough i do a prison ministry through a program called Kairos and it's a Catholic program and I'm not Catholic, but we basically go to the women, the Denver uh, women's prison after a lot of training. Like I've had hours and hours and hours of training now. So next weekend I'm going for two full days and we teach the Bible to certain inmates, not just anybody can come. And then on Tuesdays, there's just regular Bible study when anybody can come. So there's certain events where depending on the security level of the inmates, they can come and we, have a lot of food. We have a lot of Bible study. We have a lot of fun. And even the women, uh, the inmates themselves come up with what all the lesson plans are. And we're just basically there to facilitate and to support. So it is a really fascinating program. You do something very few people do. You make me feel lazy. (laughs) I feel like I go really hard. Seriously. And also props for being willing to go through the training. That's cool. I mean, it's it's one thing to be like, no, I'll show up and grace you with my presence. I already know all the things that I need to know to do this. It's another thing to be like, no, I don't know, because this is no. a tricky, difficult thing with a lot at stake. So show me how to do it well. I, I really did. Do that. you know the hardest part of the training is the dress code? So the first time I went, I had to go buy clothes at Ross because you cannot wear jeans. You cannot wear sneakers. You can't have dyed hair. And if it is, you have to put it in a tight bun. Cannot wear my nose ring. Have to hide my tattoos have to have slacks. And then there's about 10 colors you can't wear because of what the guards wear and what the inmates wear. So you have to have certain type of clothes, not too tight of clothes, blah, 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 blah. So honestly, the dress code every time is a little bit of the most difficult part for me. (laughs) Wow. Well, well, Matt, I would expand on that. It's not that it's not that you make me feel lazy. (laughs) It's that you make me think about where I'm spending my time and like what I'm working for. It makes me feel like I'm working more for me. That's better put. That's okay, because you know why, Dustin, you know why that's good? Because there are certain people that are really good at specialization. There are people like my husband, he screen prints. He's obsessed. He has to know everything about the inks, to the heat, to the vinyl, to the product, to the garment. Everything is screen print. And that makes him really, 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 really good at it. I kind of am okay at about 20 things. (laughs) You know, I can't play guitar. I can't play piano. I can half-ass saxophone. but I, I like to do a lot of things and, and do them okay, but I've never really focused on one thing. I don't think I have the energy or the, the focus or the determination to focus on one thing. If I did just speaking, I could be amazing. 
but I want to speak and I want to work with homeless women and I want to work with women in prison and I want to be in a rock band. You can't do it all. So I think people- But I think what we're driving at is that all those things have something in common. And that is they are Mm -hmm. overwhelmingly about the other people in the equation. And that is pushing us. Yeah, that's that's true. Because I I think a lot of times the things I'm working on are, I mean, let's face it, you have to have a certain amount of, uh, is, is it ego? to point mm-hmm. a camera at yourself and video something and put it on the internet, mm-hmm. you know, that deep down, that's like, Hey, you know, this isn't about me, but it's kind of about me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so all, all this stuff that you're doing, yeah, you're on stage every once in a while, but you know, I've watched you on stage. You're not bringing attention to yourself. You're often, you know, talking about other people and things like that. And all these other things that you choose to spend your time on are others focused. And that's really cool. And that's probably going to change how I look at things a little bit. Hmm. And now five insults. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, yes, five insults. Nose rings are weird. No, uh, <laughs> your <laughs> taste in hairstyles is a disaster. Male hairstyles. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and I thought you actually listened to Nickelback. Bring them. Bring them. <laughs> no, that's, I can't top that. That's the worst thing you could say to a person. And I actually don't stand by his remarks. And I'm sorry he said that oh to you. Oh, my God. Of all the things that have been said on this movie. podcast, that was the most hurtful. You know, and it is because I have a sad Nickelback memory. Tell me. Oh. Unfortunately, at the at one of our tours, it was like three months long. The sound guy, who was like a beefy, muscular dude from the Midwest, developed a crush on me and decided it would be fun to run Nickelback's, you know, that song goes like, I've been down, I've been down, you know, that song? Like, this <laughs> yes, is how you I remind do. me, you know, this is how. Yeah. yeah. He would play it and stare at me ah. and sometimes like mouth the words like to you and like point at me every single night it's terrible okay. first of all so let me gross. just say that you are the first woman i've ever spoken to for whom creepily staring and mouthing words was not a huge turn on so you're kind of the exception <laughs> there obviously <laughs> can, can i ask a question real quick yes you guys grew up in Colorado, yes. And and Leonor, I want to know specifically what your opinion on legalized marijuana is. I voted for it in. Um, I voted it. I voted for it to be legal because at the time, and I I still feel the same because um, a lot of the taxes will be going towards education, and they are, um, and also because a lot of time and money and effort and people's lives being ruined for a very, very minute high. Um, marijuana is not going to kill you. It may give you munchies. It may not be good. It is definitely not good for teenagers and children, people that whose brains are growing. But if you are 21, um, and especially if you have any kind of need for it, um, as far as cancer or pain management or seizures, then I think that it needs to be legal for people that need it for pain management reasons. It's not any different than an opioid, except for the people aren't making tons of money off of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think that it was, it had a lot to do with violence. And I even remember me being in high school and, you know, sneakily stealing it from parents and trading it around. And why do that? Why not make sure it's not laced with PCP? Why not make sure um, that people that are educated are selling it? And people that are educated can can be can buy it in an educated way and in a way that is tax and legal and clean and and above reproach. So I'm okay with it, and I think other states should do the same thing. I would love it if Wyoming so would do that... the same thing. My name was the first one on a petition to do it here, mm. which again yeah. is another unusual position. I understand for an evangelical mm-hmm. minister to hold, mm-hmm. but yeah. for me, it's about the smallest minority, which is the individual. And you own your body. Mm-hmm. So I might mm-hmm. not like it. It doesn't matter what my opinion is of what you do with your body. If you, there's no victim, there's no crime. Right. Well, okay. I, I understand why you guys say that. But I do have one other issue. Are, are we in agreement that it is addictive? I have no I idea. Wouldn't people know. Will tell you I wouldn't know personally. But I would say, um, I would say what can be addictive is the um, desire for fun that is that is prescribed. Like, I don't know if it's physically addicted, like nicotine. I don't think so. But I think that any kind of lifestyle choice can be addictive. But then again, like fine line, you know, everyone getting, you know, diet Cokes that are horrible for your body is addictive too. So I think it's splitting hairs when you talk about things that we put in our body that are addictive because there's so many, you know, I mean, cigarettes are legal. Um, 
And, you know, sugar is legal and it is highly addictive. Yeah. And I would say it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant whether or not it's addictive because it doesn't do yeah. anything to change the fact that you own you. I don't own you. I don't get to choose what you ingest. Now, I get However, to have a say as to how you treat other people when you ingest it, mm -hmm. what yeah. you do while you consume anything, like you got to take that into account and like, sink or swim with your consequences, whatever. But as a basic moral yeah, that, principle, that's my point. As a basic moral principle, you own you and I don't get to dictate to other people. Well, well my point is this. If, if, if you do choose to use it, I mean, when you end up messing your life up because, you know, you get into this downward cycle of, you know, I just want to be high all the time, which I've had several people tell me straight up, like, look, man, they tell you it's not addictive. I can tell you that I ruined my life during that period of time. And it was hard to get out of that funk. But can I ask you something? Go for it. The people that are doing that, this, this is my, my experience in life, are teenagers and, and 20s. And that's just wasting life anyway. You're just usually dicking around at those ages and you're figuring out who you are and you're making choices. I remember even though I wasn't smoking weed, I wasn't doing much with life. It's like kind of letting things lie where they lie. Now the people that I know that do weed that are in their 30s and 40s, they're highly productive. They're going to their jobs. They're working out. They're, you know, it's it's an occasional thing. Um, and so I don't find these people, I, the majority of people that I find that use it aren't people that are just wasting their life. That to me was more of an age thing and, and an experimentation thing, less than a lifestyle choice. Yeah, I, I've had the opposite experience. So some of the people that I know that are using it, it it's it's had negative mm -hmm. effects on their, their life. And I'm not arguing that it shouldn't be legalized because I think each state should make their own decision. I'm a big fan of states making their own it's decisions totally on what they want legalized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's awesome. Just, you know, the people there vote and right. you guys do what you want. But but you've seen it legalized. You've seen it rolled out. <laughs> what What's happened? Well, what was interesting at the beginning um, was that we, we went too fast. We voted yes. And then almost overnight, every single building was disgusting, <laughs> bright green with yeah. ridiculous big pot leaves and wannabe Jamaica symbolism. And there were way too many. There were too many near schools. There were too many near each other. And all these neighborhoods started to look like little ghettos. And I don't say that because of the people coming in and out. I say that because of the decorations. Then we made all these rules that were like, whoa, hold up. Denver's looking ghetto. So now you have to be kind of discreet. And after a while, people know what the branding looks like to where it can look like a dragon or a tiny little, you know, plus sign that's green um, or even just the word dispensary. And they can be so discreet now that you might not even know that that's what it is. And so now they're not too close to schools. They're not too close to each other. And for the first time, even now, um, they're starting to be able to use the banking system instead of just cash. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it is very, um, discreet. I would say there, obviously there are people that want to go to Red Rocks and do it publicly and you're not supposed to. And I don't advise that. I think that's horrible. I don't like when people do it publicly because I don't want the smell in my face. Um, and even neighborhoods that have a lot of grow houses, which are essentially just unmarked warehouses, you can smell it so strong. And those tend to be in uh, industrial areas with little houses of people that are basically poor. And so they're starting to regulate um, different machines that help keep the smell down, in fact, because nobody wants their neighborhood to smell like that. And so it is interesting so that we're, sorry, we're just having to catch up. We're playing a lot of catch up, but it's getting to a place where it's manageable for society. T two things. The, the first time I ever smelled what marijuana smelled like was at the Piggly Wiggly in Hartzell, Alabama. <laughs> okay. Piggly Wigglies. Yeah. It, and uh, I was <laughs> shopping there with my, my granddaddy. And uh, granddaddy was like in the meat aisle picking out some hamburger meat or whatever. And uh, he went to the restroom and he came out and he goes, Destin. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> he said, come here real quick. Yes, sir. And he brought me in the back in the bathroom and he says, uh, you smell that? I said, no, sir, I don't. Huh. Smell again. I said, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I smell that. He said, that's the marijuana. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he pronounces the J. That's the marijuana. Uh -huh. I want you to know what that smells like. Yeah. You need to know yeah. that that's the marijuana. I was like, yes, sir. Understood. Oh I have God. no idea what marijuana is. But anyway, that was the first time I smelled it. The second thing I wanted to bring up is I've had uh, very complicated discussions with a, a young lady in Colorado 
she ran a toxicology clinic. It was a lab. It wasn't a clinic. It was a lab where they would take people that, you know, had killed themselves because they, you know, jumped off of balconies or whatever. And they took their blood samples after the fact to measure the amount of THC in their system. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it right now, there is not a legal limit um, for THC in the bloodstream. Is that correct? I haven't figured out how to measure it on the fly. And that's part of the problem is it says it on the, on the jars, you know, take one, but certain people are different sizes. So it's the same as like Tylenol or Advil. You can say, but different people are different sizes. And it takes a more time for some people to absorb it. It's absorbed by fat. So you'll get more of a high if you have more fat in your body. I, I thought it was the other way around. I thought if if you had like it's THC is fat soluble. So the THC will go into the fat and then it can actually be stored by the body. And later on, if you burn the fat, yeah. then it would it hmm. Yeah, that's the way I yeah. understood it to be. Yeah, I'm saying the same thing. So I well, oh, okay, I mean gotcha. Yeah. Understood. It's interesting that you guys are, are rolling something out and and you know it's not completely understood. You're like ground zero trying to but figure I think all this stuff I out. I really want us to start figuring out, uh, especially CBD, um, as far as medical research and seizures and things. I think it'd be great. I think that there's such a stigma, and I think the stigma in part comes because culturally the people that have used it um, in the past have a bad rep, and so... You know, if certain people use alcohol, that's cool. Let's let's legalize that. But certain people use this. And I'll be honest, you can have a brewery and right across the street, a dispensary, and there are people of different cultures and different races going to each. <laughs> and you can just watch. Yeah. You know, who's going where and what what is what is their what is their vice of choice? But I'll say one thing. So you you're talking about the downfall. One question we have to ask ourselves as clergy people, and I say that this as a spiritual person. When we talk about alcohol, there's a fine line between I'm enjoying alcohol and I'm drunk. Then the question becomes, when I do weed, am I high or am I not? And so that for me is the fine line of saying to myself as a believer and as a, prof uh, as a, as a person that wants to live a certain standard, is it okay for me to be in a situation that is out of my control and what amount out of my control and where and when and should it be public for me? And I don't get drunk in public, and I certainly don't want to get high in public. And that is a situation where you have to decide, how do I conduct myself and how much control do I have over my choices? And I think that the point of weed is to lessen your control. And that doesn't sound to me like something that should always be encouraged. And so I'm not, I'm definitely not for every single person in every situation considering using it, even though it is legal. I'm, I'm I agree with you. With and you. that's, that's why. That's why I abstain from stuff like that is because I want to be in control of my brain mm -hmm. as much as I can. I mean, I mean, there's times I can't even control my brain because I'm tired or whatever. I know a lot of men and women in the armed forces that might have a security clearance. Mm. They know things, and this is the kind of thing people don't think about. They might know classified information mm -hmm. that could do harm to the public if it got out there. And mm. so like, I think those people have a higher calling to keep control of their brains as well mm -hmm. yeah. or their minds i guess yeah. it's not really your brain i just i just missed it all i never got into it i just the way i was raised <laughs> you know dad was a pastor you you, you know my dad he, he remembers you and yeah. mm -hmm. that just that stuff was so far off my radar that that window of time when i think it would have developed an affinity for mm -hmm. it, most alcohol like i'll have a little dinner wine occasionally with a meal but i just i don't know i'm just mm -hmm. not against it i don't care i just don't think about it. It doesn't cross my mind. You know, it's interesting. So it's weird to think we grew up in the same world because in some ways we didn't. In fact, the the world that I grew up in, all the parents were using it and grew it and enjoyed it at, at you know, picnics and parties and bonfires. And so it was at a young age, I was taught, you know, your school's going to teach you that this is illegal and this is bad. And, and please don't tell them I do this, but you know, we decide what we choose. And, um, so I grew up around it my whole life, you know, my whole life. It, it was this weird, um, it was kind of like alcohol, but it was like if you grew up in the prohibition, it's like, you know, like if your parents are having some alcohol yeah. on the side. Yeah. So I, and so when it was time to be legal, I wasn't scared of it. Cause again, I'd been around it and I'd seen people that just put on sweats and talk about the news, not no, no crazy party or dancing or anything or laying, staring at the stars. It was just like, it's the end of the day and I'm going to relax with my spouse in my backyard privately. And this is how I'm going to live. And I never thought too much about it. The funny thing about where I stand on all of this stuff is that I find myself constantly arguing 
for the freedom to do things I don't partake of at all. They, they just, <laughs> I, I'm arguing for people to do all kinds of stuff. That's yeah, not my cup of Fight tea. Fight for the right to not party. Yeah, that's it, good. There you go. That's that's what I'm fighting hard <laughs> for, I guess. I appreciate what you said, though. Just briefly, a couple minutes ago, you're talking about how now we're trying to give dispensaries access to using the banking system. And I think those two things are a lot of what's gone wrong with the whole thinking about just drugs, pot, whatever, is mm -hmm. if you don't have, if you tell people that they don't have access to the justice system to work out their differences and that they don't have access to the financial system to work with their money, they're, they're going to take those things into their own hands in ways that yep. are going to be shady and damaging. It is mm -hmm. way better to let the market play out in a place where you can adjudicate your gripes with somebody else through like, you know, an official mediator from the government, because then you don't shoot each mm -hmm. other so much. And a lot of the, and a I, lot of the drug violence just comes down to the fact of how else are you going to work it out? Right. And of course, all of Denver, Denver wants it to be legal everywhere because our rents are through the freaking roof. So everyone needs oh, to get wow. on board so we can relax. Our rents are insane and it's, it's the market is happening because one of the main things is legal weed. And so um, how about that? we need everyone to just follow suit here. <laughs> We're dying here. Well, well, this is going to sound like a joke, but it's not. This question is a serious question. Okay. What about meth? Like wh where, where is the line? Because why shouldn't we legalize meth? Well, if you were going to legal it, legalize it, it would have to be in laboratories and it would have to be with people who know how it works. And isn't that kind of what opiates are? I mean, maybe I'm confused. Maybe I don't know. But isn't it just a, isn't, doesn't meth just exist because it is illegal? But if you could get a prescription, you'd rather use that stuff? I don't know. I just know that anybody that's ever tried meth that I've ever heard of ends up, <laughs> I mean, their I life think, is destroyed. It's a disaster. I think meth, and I, and I don't know either, but I think meth mimics prescription drugs. And I think if people could get unlimited quantities of prescription drugs, they would. Um, so it's not a matter of if it's illegal. It's just that we have systems in place to the, you know, the government has, and states have already chosen to make unlimited prescription drugs illegal. So it's already, and the fact that people make it in their own factories or in their own little, you know, bus warehouses or whatever is because we've already decided it should be illegal. Yeah. I just think, I just think it's an interesting question because Matt, I know you've gone to, you know, you've worked with the the police and your local area and, and you've experienced this, right? You've experienced people that have gone down yeah, this road. I, I swing by, I get called in from time to time to try to help with the ugly stuff. Yeah. And so it's a completely different animal. Like I'm not advocating that we should do, you know, have more laws and more control or whatever. I, I just, I think it's an interesting philosophical question. At what point do you decide you need to protect people from themselves because they're not making the right choices? And my philosophical question in response to that is would I rather live in a world where people do meth or would I, would I rather live in a world where we do what it takes to stop meth? And that's a mm -hmm. hard question well, because meth is really destructive. Well, I'll give you so is stopping people from doing meth. Well, in Florida, for example, you don't have to wear a helmet when you ride a motorcycle. You don't in here In Alabama, either. you do. You don't in Denver either. Yeah. Do you think that's a good idea? I think it's up to the individual and it sucks because I have an uncle who died from that. But, you know, at the same time, it's like, well, you take the risk. Yeah. So as long as people are willing to live with the consequences and when they melt down their lives, I mean, I mean, that's just the way it is. But but we don't live with the consequences. Like it, If the trend toward the state covering all of the medical costs of all of people, if that's the way things continue to trend, then all of a sudden all of our neighbors have a vested interest in our personal safety habits. And that, that's one of my problems with going too far down that road is I think then we're mm. in everybody else's business and we have to control it. Your obesity affects my pocketbook if we go too far down that road. Can I be honest and say something that makes me very, very, very angry? Okay. Yes. Is that food stamps will easily pay for soda and junk food. That makes me crazy because... And I know, I, I know it shouldn't be, you know, it's none of my business. But it kind of is because it's, it's your money. I know, I know. But I'm just saying it makes me angry. I know it's, it's not like I want it illegal, but at the same time, it just, this is one of my pet peeves that makes me so sad is that people can, you know, they're not buying healthy food for their kids. You know, they're buying tons of soda or fruit snacks yeah. or crap, you know, it just makes me angry. It's one of those things that you want to regulate it to death, but at the end of the day, you know, what, this, what good does that do anybody? What if they're buying Twinkies and grape 
grape soda. <laughs> and I tell you, if they, if they pray over it, it will be such as the blood in the body. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I would not have picked scum That's of the funny. earth to be into the full transubstantiation mm. thing. I'm. I would transubstantiation. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. And and on Reformation Day of all days. Hey guys, my uh, oh yeah, I lost a filling and it's chewing a hole in my cheek. So they got me in for an mm. emergency appointment, and it's at three. So that's in seventeen minutes. So I probably better bounce. Okay, Leonor, if if he's got to go to the dentist appointment, we want to make sure everybody has access to everything that you've done. I mean, I know you've <laughs> changed my life for the better with everything you've done. So wh- where can they find everything? They can go to www.urbanskye.org. Um, if they want to hear former uh, sermons that I've given, they can go to scumoftheearth.net and they can check out The Fast Feeling and Five Iron Frenzy, which are the bands that I'm part of. And they're really, really good. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. And thank you for actually confirming that Matt did actually know you and he wasn't trying to just get bonus And that he points. was a complete poser. You actually, you took it really easy on me. I'm, I'm grateful. When we're, when we're done recording, I'm going to express to you again in no uncertain terms how nice that was of you. Okay, then I'll give you five put downs. <laughs> good to know you guys. Very good. <laughs> Thanks this for having me. This is a ton me. of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Leonore. Bye.